Well, Johnson becomes president, as you well know, in April 1865 when Lincoln uh, dies. And in May, he uh, issues a procl uh, his proclamation of Reconstruction, okay? His plan of Reconstruction, which he says is Lincoln's plan. And this became part of the old mythology. Johnson is just putting to effect Lincoln's previous plan of Reconstruction. Now remember, Congress is not in session. When the Civil War broke out, Lincoln called Congress into special session on July 4th. But Johnson doesn't really want Congress around. He thinks he can settle Reconstruction between April 1865 and December 1865 when Congress will come into session. So Johnson's plan of Reconstruction is basically that all so white Southerners, with a little exception we'll see in a minute, have to take an oath of loyalty, of future loyalty, not past loyalty, future loyalty to the Union, which is the same that Lincoln had asked them to take, and they would then receive uh, a kind of a pardon for any crimes they had committed and restoration of all their property, with the exception of slaves, of course. But all that land that was kind of being disputed would go back as long as they took their oath of loyalty and got their uh, pardon. Now, the exception, though, is critical here. Johnson said, the only ones who this doesn't apply to are the top officers of the Confederacy. Okay, that's pretty clear, Davis, etc. But also anybody who, whose, property, who, whose uh, property value exceeded $20,000 in 1860. That's your planters. They're not going to get their, they're not going to get this blanket pardon. They have to get individual pardons from the president. So Johnson is trying, you see, to keep those planters out of the political process that he's putting into effect, the $20,000 people. By the way, this makes a mockery of the idea that Johnson was just putting Lincoln's plan into effect. Lincoln had never suggested anything like that. Lincoln, in fact, thought that many of the well-to-do planters were the more loyal in the South, and, or at least more realistic, and would work with the federal government. Lincoln didn't have any animus toward the $20,000 people. This was Johnson's plan. The second proclamation at the same time outlined a process where governments, new governments would be created in the South. He appointed provisional governors for southern states, most of them people who had been for the Union during the war, or at least certainly in the secession crisis. Um, he outlined that they would call a state convention, rewrite their state constitutions to abolish slavery, ratify the 13th Amendment, repudiate the ordinance of secession, repudiate the Confederate debt, and then they could have elections and set up new governments. So the requirements, look at the, the requirements are you have to accept the end of slavery and the defeat of the Confederacy. That secession is no, no longer viable. In other words, they just have to accept they lost the war, right? Secession is dead, slavery is dead. That's it. There's no other demand on them. The people who will vote in these elections are the people who receive pardons and who had the right to vote in 1860. Well, that's uh, no blacks, of course. So this is all, f whites are going to control completely the process of, uh, uh, of reconstruction. Now, Johnson did say when people complain, look, black suffrage is for the states. The states determine this. I, I, it's not my business whether they give people the right to vote or not. He said if, they, if a state wants to give black men the right to vote, Cool, I have no problem with that. But of course, only one state in the entire history of the United States, from the Constitution to the Civil War, only once had a state that didn't allow blacks to vote given them the right to vote. Many states had taken it away, but only one state had ever done it. I'm sure you all know which state I'm talking about. But um, no, um, Rhode Island, Rhode Island. Uh, but don't get so uh, uh, excited about this because it was basically it was a punishment to Rhode Island in the 1840s when uh, after what they, this is not worth going, the, the Door War, they had a little internal war about political control and voting. And when the anti-Door group took over, the Door group had, um, t had taken the right to vote away from blacks. And when the other guys came back in, they gave the right to vote back to blacks in Rhode Island as a kind of way of sticking it to the door people. So that, but still, but the idea that any southern state would voluntarily 
give the right to vote to the former slaves was absurd, of course. It was, ne it was never going to happen. Um, well, Johnson's Reconstruction Plan goes into effect in the summer and fall of 1865. Um, and very quickly, it's clear it's not quite worth it working the way he expected. First of all, the elections don't, ele the, the, when people go to the polls, they don't elect unionist yeomen to office, they elect the old Confederates because they're the leaders. The, the yeomen are not organized. To just set up elections doesn't mean that, that people who were not politically organized before are suddenly going to be able to take control. Also, a lot of them, you know, people respect that these are the leaders of their society, former generals, former... Now, most of the people elected as members of conventions and then governors, legislatures, senators, congressmen, claimed to be pro-union. Most of them had opposed secession. You didn't get, like, you know, the fire eaters of South Carolina being elected. People were tired of the Confederacy by this point. But to Northerners, these guys are not loyal. The, many of them had served in the Confederate Army, uh, generals, these kind of guys. They, maybe they were critical of secession in 1860, but they all went with their states and joined the Confederacy. Nobody was elected who was really uh, opposed to secession, or very, very few. Um, so, uh, it, it, and, and then, of course, uh, the pardoning situation breaks down. Johnson thought that he would very carefully e issue these individual pardons while figuring out what the real views of these old planters were. But very quickly, the pardoning thing falls apart, partly because of the reason I mentioned before, you get a, a sort of a business in pardons. Planters flock to Washington, there are a whole set of like pardon agents spring up who take money in order to get the application to the president. By the fall, uh, people, are, uh, pardon seekers are besieging the White House every day because it's very important to get that pardon because you get your land back if the federal government or blacks or anyone else has taken your land. So people were very desperate to get this, uh, to get their pardons back and you get the right to hold political office again. Um, um, so in nine, by the end of the year, 14,000 individual pardons had been issued. So instead of being a careful process of evaluating the history and the prospects of these people, it just became a wholesale uh, a wholesale process, and so the idea of keeping the old planters out of political power collapses uh, very, very quickly. 